Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. I was just 24 years old, not one month into the FBI, when my partner and I discovered the man who would become the most prolific serial killer in history. This was back in 2013, when the dark web and its market for drugs, weapons, and child exploitation were on the rise. The FBI was just beginning to make arrests for crimes via the dark web. Me, my partner, and a few cops were sent to a location in now then Minnesota, when they'd traced the IP address of some creep buying child exploitation material online. It was a gray, drizzling Saturday evening when we pulled up to the suspect's residence. It was a run-down, one-story house with an overgrown lawn and dirty walls. My partner, Agent Creighton, banged on the door announcing, this is the FBI, we need to talk, Mr. Sully. We have a warrant and we'll enter forcibly. I thought I could just make out the sound of rapid, heavy footsteps from within the home. Creighton rolled his eyes, his graying mustache twitched, and he said to me, hey Lou, you mind running around back real quick? Uh, okay. I ran around the house, my hand on my holstered weapon. In the back, I found a scrawny, balding man in a tank top crawling out a window. Back here, I roared. I sprinted towards him and tackled him before he could start running. An hour later, we were in the Minneapolis FBI headquarters. The perv was sitting alone in a cell, and I was in a darkened computer lab, sifting through his confiscated computer. Crichton came in and handed me a mug of coffee. Anything on his monitor? No, looks like he managed to wipe his history. Doesn't really matter. We traced the purchases to this device's IP address, and that's enough. Creighton nodded. That's good. But take a look at this, he said, handing me a flash drive. It was bent and cracked, but it looked like it would still function. The perp had it in his pocket as he was making a break for it. He was thumping his ass around on the seat of the car. At first, I thought he was high. Then I realized he was trying to destroy something in his pocket. I plugged the drive in, and after screening it for viruses, started looking through the files it stored. Most of them were adult content, artwork, photos, videos. Some of it was legal. Some was definitely illegal. Creighton crossed himself a couple times as we slogged through the filth. I'll never understand, he murmured, shaking his head, how someone can get this sick. At the end of the flash drive's contents was a file folder, simply titled, High Score. I, what the hell does that mean, High Score, I asked. I suppose we'd better find out, someone's gotta testify. I clicked on the folder. It opened to a list of MP4 files, each labeled Episode 13, Episode 17, Episode 18, and so on. The numbers were almost continuous, but jumped occasionally. Watch it just be pirated Glee episodes, I muttered, and clicked on the first one. The screen showed a first-person video of someone with black sleeves and gloves revving up a chainsaw. Then, ACDC's Thunderstruck started blaring. The video went through a montage of images as the hard rock song played. Night vision footage of walking through the woods, the black-clad hands loading shells into a long-barreled shotgun, twirling a Belisong knife, knocking an arrow to a plastic composite bow, the shadow of a man running through a dimly lit sewer tunnel, footage of the games, Pac-Man, Doom, Call of Duty, and one other I didn't recognize. Words appeared over the images, John Doe presents, a shot of a lightning bolt over windswept trees, then a black screen and a title card, high score in dripping red letters, just as the ACDC song dropped its dramatic refrain. The whole sequence was obviously homemade, but rather well done. This should be interesting, Creighton muttered. The screen and song faded to a video of a man dressed completely in black, black trousers, black hoodie, black boots and gloves. Only his skull mask was a dull gray. One side of the mask had a video camera built into it with the camera's lens set over the mask's left eye. Hey everyone, before we get to the action, I just want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart, said the man. His voice had a metallic, resonating echo. He was clearly using a voice changer. Despite that, there was a clear southern twang to his voice. I couldn't do what I do without your support. 
If I had a day job, I couldn't travel. I couldn't practice my art as much as I get to, and I couldn't bring you these videos. Y'all know my dream, to be the very best at what I do. And I can pursue that dream thanks to you guys. I just want y'all to know, you're all the best. And if you have a dream, you should do whatever you can to make it a reality. The video switched to first-person footage of someone thumping through the woods at night. A set of digital numbers marked the date, August 25, 2009. Occasionally, the camera panned down to the cameraman's arm, carrying a large duffel bag. The cameraman arrived at the edge of a clearing. There was a quaint farmhouse in the middle of the field. Light came from just one window on the second story. Today we're working from Missouri. I spent a couple days scouting this home. It belongs to an old couple named John and Alice Walker. They don't interact with the locals often. I learned a bit about them by watching them last night, and some by just asking the locals. The video flashed to another first-person image. It's in a bar, in front of a pool table. Two middle-aged men stand on the other side of the table. Looks like he's using a button cam, Creighton whispered. A voice, probably the same as the narrator, said, Hey! As I was driving, I saw this really nice light green house in a clearing a few miles north of here. Don't suppose it's for sale? The audio was someone distorted. Nah, said one of the bearded men as he aimed a pool cue. Belongs to some old couple. I think the man was a lawyer. They're retired now. Far as I know, they're sort of shut-ins. Never see them in church or town halls. Then the video flashed back to the woods and farmhouse at night. The narrator said, when you're gathering information about a target, it's important to be subtle. Try to mask your interest in your target. Like how I pretended to be interested in the house. And don't pursue the subject too far. You don't want people remembering how you were asking all about the target the day before they turned up dead. My eyes widened, and I turned from the video to my partner. Creighton, are we watching a murder? The cameraman jogged from the edge of the clearing towards the farmhouse. He circled around to an egress window. Then he pulled a glass cutter out of his bag. He silently cut a semicircle in the window and then climbed into the house's basement, pulling his duffel bag in after him. After starting the gas, I wait for 30 minutes in the basement, but I'll skip that part for you guys, said the voiceover. The video flashed and then the cameraman returned to the kitchen and pulled out a small device that looked like a lighter. He held it up for the camera. This little beauty, the voice said, I rigged up in my shop just for this kill. I press a button in a remote control I have in my bag, and this wire here will yank the switch and turn the lighter on, usually useless. But if you light it inside a house where the stove's been on too long, well then things get interesting. He placed it on the kitchen counter then snuck back downstairs leaving the basement door open. He went to the window and started punching the glass. There's gonna be an explosion. Kitchen windows will break. I broke the glass here to make it look like the explosion blew the basement glass from the inside, explained the narrator. Then the cameraman climbed out, ran a dozen meters away from the house, turned around, pulled a remote controller out of his bag, popped open a cap, and pressed a button. There was an explosion. The house's windows lit up red, the kitchen windows indeed shattered, and a roaring inferno streamed out of them. The cameraman watched as the house burned. Over the roar of the flames, you could just make out the screams. After about a minute, the cameraman turned and ran into the woods. You could just hear sirens blaring in the distance. And that, my friends, makes kill number 18 and 19. I just beat Jeffrey Dahmer's record. As he said it, red digital numbers imposed themselves over the footage saying, High scores, Luis Garavito, 199, Ted Bundy, 20, Jeffrey Dahmer, 17, John Doe, 19. The video switched to a title card, high score, and then ended. Creighton and I shared a horrified look. How many episodes are there? He whispered. Exited the video and scrolled down the file goes to 92. Over the next few hours, Crichton and I watched every single one of those videos. Not all the episodes were on the drive. There we only got a total of 52 episodes. In every one, 
This John Doe killed at least one person, sometimes two, three, or more. Sometimes he made it look like an accident. Fire, gas leaks, falling, hit and runs. He also liked to drug people and then make it look like they shot or hung themselves. He was always scrupulous to record his own handiwork, but disguise it to any investigators. Other times he would stab, snipe, or even shoot his victims with a bow and arrow. Bow hunting was his favorite. He would proudly record himself burying or hiding the bodies. And he was good at that part too. He regularly talked about forensics and police procedures and how to hide from them. His favorite trick was to buy a dog from a shelter and kill it. Then he would bury the human body in a deep grave, cover it up partly, and bury the dog over it. Thus, if police dogs ever found the dig site, they would find the dead dog, assume that was all there was, and move on. He picked his targets by how easily he could kill them and hide his tracks. Most of his victims were lonely old couples, homeless folks, hunters, and campers. But he had no preference for age, sex, race, or religion. You're not racist if you hate everybody equally. He laughed in episode 37, where he killed a gay black couple by shooting through the bedroom window of their lakeside cabin with a suppressed sniper rifle. He traveled around the country, literally throwing darts at a paper map to pick which county he would hit. He lived in a small RV camper, which occasionally appeared in his videos, but the license plate was always blurred out. He always put dates on his episodes. The earliest was August 25, 2009. The most recent was September 18, 2013. They were almost always between 6 and 30 minutes long. There was always footage of a murder, but sometimes before or after the killing, he would film himself, always in his skull mask, and make an announcement about the channel or opine on his favorite guns, video games, and serial killers throughout history. With the collection of episodes in the flash drive, we had evidence for 59 kills, but by episode 92, he claimed to have 111 kills. In that episode, he simply walks around Central Park of New York City one night, jabbing a concealed hunting knife into the temples of three separate junkies as they slept on park benches. At the end, the video flashed over to him, still with his black hoodie and video camera skull mask, sitting at a table inside his RV. Guys, last night I beat Pedro Lopez's record. Pedro Lopez, the monster of the Andes. He had 110 kills. I have 111. This makes me, guys, this makes me the second greatest serial killer who ever lived. I want to thank all of you for being with me along the way. As far as we know, the pigs are still clueless. They have no idea what we've been doing and we've done is truly special. I'm so proud of myself and I'm so proud of y'all too, but we've still got a ways to go if I'm gonna make it to the very top. Luis Garavito, La Bestia, had 193 confirmed kills, which means I have 83 to go if I wanna top that. The fun is nowhere near finished. And uh, before I sign out, I just wanna say, I used I didn't use to believe in God or faith, or if there was a God, he didn't care about me. But now, well, I think that if you have a dream, that's a gift. That's a gift from God. And if you work hard at achieving it, if you prove yourself worthy, he will reward you. So I'll just say this. God bless each and every one of you. I love y'all. And, uh, good night. The last video on the flash drive ended. Crichton and I shared a wide-eyed look. What was the date on that last one? He asked me. September 18th, five days ago, I whispered. I think we better make some calls. Nine hours later, in the early hours of the morning, Creighton and I were on a video conference call with director of the FBI in Washington, D.C., and five other senior agents. Both of us had bags under our eyes and stubble on our cheeks. We hadn't slept for over a day. I was drinking so much coffee I might as well have put in an IV and pumped it into my veins. At this point, we're about certain every one of the videos is authentic. I had every expert I could reach working overnight to be verify them. This is real, said one of the leaders. I've got people hiding the victims, said another. So far, each of them matches up with a disappearance or death somewhere in the continental US. We can scout him out, right? On the dark web? Track him down by his IP? Asked the director. I spoke up to that. Maybe. 
but it's possible to mask your IP address or change it if you know you've been pinged. And for all we know, he could be posting his videos from a different computer every time. Maybe the local library of whatever town he passes through. Well, if that fails, finding this guy isn't going to be easy, said a criminal profiler. Most serial killers have a target demographic, a favorite method of killing, and a lot of them stay in one place. You can infer things about the killer from those details, but not this guy. He goes around the country randomly, killing whenever he can get away with it. What about his vehicle, asked the director. I saw his RV in a couple videos. The license plate is always blurred out, I answered, and he either switches the vehicle or gets it repainted every now and then. In one of his videos, he says he always travels 80 miles from a kill, Creighton said, before he posts an episode. It's kind of impressive how much he knows about police procedures. This guy's basically a killing machine. For a moment, the director sat in silence, thinking. Then he spoke. For now, we use the leads we have and see where it takes us. Creighton, Lou, I want you to talk to the man with the flash drive. Make whatever threat or promise you need to get him to tell us what he knows. All right, you play good cop, Creighton said. Oh, come on, I protested. You're old and grandfatherly. You have a mustache. You should play good cop. I'm 44, Creighton said, frowning, and my mustache is very authoritative. You're young and handsome and, well, he stopped. What? And you're 5'6". Taller men are generally more threatening. Screw you, I'm 5'8", I laughed, hiding my pain behind a grin. Fine, I'll be good cop. We burst into the interrogation room, Creighton swaggering in first. He slapped a folder on the metal desk. On the other side was the bald, scrawny man we had arrested. He smelled of sweat and grime. His tank top had several stains. Wilson Sully, Creighton rumbled. If it was just child exploitation and way too much hentai we found on you flash drive, you'd probably go away for just a year or two. But that show, high score? Mate, paying to watch that shit makes you an accomplice to murder. 59 murders on that flash drive. You could go to prison for decades. The pervert's eyes widened. He started fidgeting with the links of his handcuffs. Creighton got up and started pacing around the room. I've heard a lot of stories about prisons. Every prison is its own society. You know, made up of thieves, gangsters, murderers. There's almost nothing you could do that's so bad even prison would hate you. Almost. Creighton leaned in right behind Sully and hissed, You know the one type of person who's an outcast even in prison? Pedophiles. I watched silently, forced to admit that Creighton actually made a half-decent bad cop. Then I remembered I had a role too. Creighton, come on, stop trying to scare him, I said. Creighton went back to his seat but leaned forward, his fierce glare boring into Sully's skull like a drill. Do you know what prison does to its outcasts, Mr. Sully? Creighton whispered. They, well, let's just say they make the pornos you have on that flash drive look like Saturday morning cartoons. Imagine that being your life, Sully. Imagine that every night, year after year after year. The perp shrunk into his seat, his eyes so ridiculously wide I had to suppress a giggle. Creighton, for crying out loud, I said, then turned back to Sully. Look, that's not, okay, that doesn't always happen, I said, pretending to reassure him. It's not, I mean... Maybe we could keep you separate from the general population. I made a show of pausing to think. Sully looked at me desperately, like he was drowning, and I was just standing still with a life boy in hand. Look, if you help us, I think I can help you, I said. How? He demanded. He had a high, gravelly voice. You have to tell us everything you know about high score. Sully's face fell. What? Creighton asked. They know where I live who I am, the moderators. When it comes to hacking, they're on another level. They probably know I've been caught already, and they'd find me wherever I went. We can protect you, Sully, we protect witnesses. He didn't look convinced. Do you really think they're more powerful than the federal government? Nelly Zied, he turned and looked behind at the camera in the ceiling corner. 
Then he spoke. High score started in 2012. That's when John released his first few videos. They were pay per view, but I recorded some of them so I could rewatch them. What do you know about the killer? Creighton asked. No one on the Darknet's ever seen his face. He talks about himself a little, but he never gives away anything that could identify him. They think he's from the South. He hates his dad, who was a cop or something. He also has an official chat room that you can pay to join. Ever been on the chat room, I asked. He nodded furtively. Sometimes there's a vote on which method he'll use for his next kill. The more you donate, the more your vote counts. Very democratic. You ever voted? Creighton asked. Sully shook his head vigorously. How many people do you think are on the chat room? I asked. There are 413 members. Probably more people only watch his videos. Why do you think he does it? Creighton asked. He wants to become the most prolific serial killer in history. No one knows exactly why. Just that he'll probably succeed. Creighton and I left the cell to plan. We made a few calls, and then a plan. Then we returned to Sully's cell. Mr. Sully, I'd like to offer you a deal. I said. Ultimately, Sully got off easy, with two years of house arrest. Any device he owned that connected to the internet was confiscated, and he was frequently searched. In return, Sully helped me adopt his darknet persona. I took over his high score account, called Fly on the Wall 3, and pretended to be him in the chat room. There were a few hundred boards and message threads, with logs going back all the way to 2009. The people in the chat debated all sorts of things, where to get the best drugs, crack versus weed, rising and falling Bitcoin prices, and of course, the high score videos. They argued over which kill was most entertaining, most efficient or hardest to track by the police. Some talked about starting their own careers, as in becoming serial killers. One or two posted photos of corpses in the woods. We tried tracing John Doe's IP, but he was using a proxy server. We also tried to trace a few of the chat members, but couldn't find anything. Just then, one of the high scores moderators messaged me. Splice.dagger. Hey there, you fly on the wall three, everything all right? Couldn't help but notice you've been online for hours, but haven't said a thing. Fly on the wall or three. Yeah, all good. Actually, there was a specific thread I was looking for. Something about John Doe's history. Splice.dagger. No one really knows. I don't know and I run his damn site. Speaking of which, I noticed you trying to trace other members' IP addresses. That's not allowed, Sully. I'll let you off with a warning this time, but do it again and I might have to permaban you. Maybe even send someone over for a visit. They couldn't actually know Sully had been arrested, could they? We'd made sure there was no news and no videos. We even bought the same drugs that Sully bought through Darknet markets before he'd been arrested to keep up appearances. And that's how it began. That's how I learned of John Doe, who was already one of the most prolific serial killers in history. That's how I made a deal with a demon to catch the devil. That's how I joined the high score cult and became a monster to catch a monster. Part two. The top brass decided not to share any information on this serial killer with the media. The first reason was that if we let the public, and thus John Doe, know we were onto him, he would stop posting information about himself online and it would be that much harder to catch him. <coughs> Secondly, they were worried that if they made knowledge of high score public, edgy kids and psychos would see him as a rebel, an idol. Small fan clubs and cults would pop up around the US to assist John Doe, or even imitate him. It's twisted, but a few people actually adore serial killers. Jeffrey Dahmer had women send him love letters while he was in prison. Ted Bundy even married and had a daughter with one of his fans while he was on trial. The third reason was to avoid mass panic. It would have been a PR nightmare. Hey everybody, apparently there's an extremely efficient serial killer running around killing as many people as he can. He's posting all his kills online, but we're completely unable to track him down. So, be careful out there. Part of me wonders if part of the reason they wanted to keep this whole thing under wraps was that this guy was straight up making us look bad. Part of me wonders, if we had gone public, would people out there be more cautious? What if even one of John Doe's victims had thought twice about going out alone at night? Are there people out there who would have been alive if we had made a different choice? 
Over the next few years, I watched High Score religiously. At first, whenever I saw someone die, I felt a sinking feeling in my chest. I'd get nauseous and fantasize about arresting John Doe, testifying in court, and watching him crackle and burn on the electric chair. But with every death, I felt a bit less sick, a bit less hot with rage. Over time, John Doe became less of a monster in my mind and more like a force of nature, a fact of life. Hear about your co-worker's grandpa dying of cancer? That's life, you shrug it off. Hear about people in another country dying in an earthquake? You shrug it off. Me, I watch videos of people being hunted like animals as a job. I shrug it off. I was aware of how desensitized I was becoming. I didn't like it, but there wasn't really anything I could do about it. Someone had to catch this monster, and to do that, someone had to learn everything there was to know about him. Here is a sampling of high score episodes. Episode 100, released in February of 2014, in the small town of Utah. John Doe, with his regular skull mask, pulls several gun parts out of a backpack and assembles them into an AK-47. Hey guys, it's my 100th video, and I'm actually really excited to have my first sponsorship. I feel like this is a big step in the career of every content creator, and I couldn't be happier with my first sponsor, Agora. Ever since the feds shut down the Silk Road site, a lot of you have been asking me what I think the best marketplace on the dark web is, and honestly, my endorsement goes to Agora. And not just because they sent me this complimentary AK-47, plus a suppressor, he says, pulling out a gun silencer and screwing it onto the muzzle of his weapon. I really think Agora is the best marketplace. Now I want to take full advantage of this gift, and I want to celebrate 100 episodes of High Score with a bang, so we're going to go hunting tonight. John Doe proceeds to gun down three separate tents worth of people residing in public camping areas. Each time he got a hit, video game style digital numbers appeared on the screen, marking kills, number 140 through 148. Episode 110, released in July of 2015, occurred in Great Deutsch Wood in Minnesota. At night, John Doe sneaks onto a private residence, picks the lock of a door to a garage, and plants a homemade bomb inside the motor of a private speedboat. Later, he sits on the shore with a long-distance camera and watches the same boat ride Lake Superior. Then, he detonates the bomb with a remote trigger and watches the boat burn and sink. Digital letters and video game-style pings announce Kill 164 and Kill 165 as the boat's riders sink beneath the waves. Afterwards, John Doe turns the camera to himself. He sits atop a large rock and addresses the audience. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I wanted to address the controversy that's been welling up this week. So apparently, Tokyo Red Room said that I got no style during one of their streams last week. Some of my fans who were watching started arguing in the chat. One of them actually threatened to go to the feds and got perma-banned. First of all, we never joke about going to the law. Communities like Tokyo Red Room, and this one, are built on trust and secrecy. Secondly, they actually have a point. I met the guys at Tokyo Red Room when we did our collab back in 2012. I have a lot of respect for what they do. There's absolutely an art to it, and I love how they let their viewers participate by deciding how the victim dies. A lot of my personal heroes, the most famous serial killers in history, had a favorite method of killing. Jack the Ripper, for instance, he only killed five people, but the way he did it was so iconic that everyone knows him. As for me, I'm the numbers guy. I don't kill in especially gnarly ways or strike fear into the hearts of a particular city. I work as efficiently and quietly as I can. I think the fact that I have a web series about my work is pretty distinctive and my mask isn't too shabby, but at the end of the day, I do quantity over quality. I think that's what Tokyo Red Room meant when they said I don't have style. I'm not offended, it's just an observation. I know some of y'all also watch Tokyo Red Room, so don't feel like you need to go boycotting them or defending my honor. There's no hard feelings between us, that's all. Thanks for following me on my journey to become the greatest serial killer who ever lived. By the way, a lot of you have been asking if I'm ever going to do a face reveal. Right now I don't think so. 
I need to stay anonymous for my own safety, but I might consider it someday. Anyway, God bless and goodbye. Episode 115, September 2015. Location unknown. A caption reads, Location, home base. The video takes place in an unfinished basement, which has appeared several times throughout the web series, often when John demonstrates his equipment and preparation. I've been thinking about the whole spat about Tokyo Red Room. I actually would like to start putting a bit more art in some of my work. I'm thinking about doing a special episode every now and then. Let me know what y'all think of this episode, and if you'd be interested in more like it. The camera shows several cages of rats on a table in a dimly lit cellar. Many of them squeal and claw at each other through the bars of their cages. Poor guys. I had to starve them a bit, but dinner time's almost here. The camera turns to a naked woman on a table. Leather straps hold her down tightly by her arms, legs, waist, and forehead. She seemed to be unconscious. The cameraman walks over to the woman and starts slapping her cheek. Hey, Jessica, he says. Her eyelids flutter and then open wide. She can't move her head and is gagged, but she groans in shock, her eyes leaping back and forth. Good morning. For future reference, you might want to be a little more careful about who serves you drinks. That is, if you had a future. One by one, John Doe picks up each cage and places them right against the woman's bare flesh, against her legs, her waist, her chest, and on either side of her face. The rats squeal and claw at her hungrily. The woman attempts to move and scream, but she is held fast. Tears stream down her cheeks. How's this for style, Tokyo Red Room? Then he pulls up the cage doors one by one. The rats are terribly hungry. She does not die quickly or quietly. That marks killed them 167. After that episode, I logged on to High Score's chat room and looked for people's reactions to the episode. They loved it. Episode 117, October 2015. John Doe spends 15 minutes reviewing the game Undertale declaring it to be the pinnacle of human artistic achievement. He finishes the review with, Oh yeah, here's a murder. Then he shows footage in the woods. A hunter with a rifle and orange vest walks along in the distance. John Doe casually brings up his own rifle and shoots the man in the head. Oh no, another hunting accident. Why do these happen to me all the time? Kill Dover 169, Episode 121, released February of 2016. This one is almost entirely from a button camera. John Doe visits a bar in Nevada. He talks with a few women, and once he learns that one of them owns a house and lives alone, goes home with her. The shirt comes off and the button cam falls to the ground, but there are sounds of intercourse for a few minutes. Once it's done, John and the woman talk. They talk about life, relationships, intimacy, John's partner admits she feels lonely much of the time, sometimes desperately so. John replies that he used to feel the same way. He then tells the woman about an exercise he does. He tells her to imagine, if she were to commit suicide, what note she would write. To write a suicide note every night and to leave the note under her pillow as she sleeps. John claims that doing this changed the way he viewed his life and helped him to dream of how his life could be better. After that, John takes his shirt and leaves. A caption says two nights later, and the video switches to footage of walking through a neighborhood at night. John Doe walks up to a house, the same woman's house. He picks the lock to a back door and sneaks in, switching his camera to night vision. He goes up to the woman's bedroom, where she sleeps soundly. John Doe slips his hand under her pillow and pulls out a piece of paper. He holds the paper to a camera, a suicide note, he puts the note on the drawer next to the bed. Perfect, he whispers. Then he takes out a pistol. Very slowly, he puts the gun in the woman's hand, wraps his fingers around the grip, and moves the woman's hand and pistol to her temple. Then he makes her squeeze the trigger. A few drops of blood stick to his night vision goggles. John Doe sprints out of the house, locking the back door behind him. There's a small thicket behind the woman's house. He runs across the thicket, and comes into a small parking lot where a dark green RV sits alone. It's well lit by a street light, but as always, the license plate is blurred out. John gets in and stomps on the gas, 
making a getaway just as sirens blare in the distance. John Doe laughs as he drives. I got her to write a suicide note. That's amazing. I can't believe that worked. The victim was later identified as dot dot dot, who was believed to have committed suicide two days before the episode was released. After all, there was a handwritten note found beside her body. Episode 125, released May 4th, 2016. The episode takes place in John's basement. To celebrate his 125th episode and National Star Wars Day, John Doe demonstrates how he uses colored gas and a modified blowtorch to create a glowing red lightsaber. The victim is a chubby, hairy man, dressed in nothing but a pair of underwear and a clone trooper mask. He is strapped to the same table as the woman in episode 115. John Doe's lightsaber doesn't so much cut as sear. It's very painful for his victim, but not deadly until John gets tired and decides to pour gasoline on the man. You were the chosen one, Anakin. John Doe laughed as the victim burned alive. Should have bought a Darth Vader helmet. Damn. Kill 180. The video flashes to footage of John Doe, standing in front of a dripping red canvas. As always, he has his trademark gray skull mask with a video camera built into the left side of the skull. Thanks for watching the 125th episode of High Score, guys. I've been posting this for almost seven years now. I want to thank everyone who's been with me all the way, part of the way, some of the way. And even if you're new here, thank you. I love killing, I would do it even without the web series. But getting to share it with you makes it so much more meaningful. I'm thinking about doing a special episode where we have a little extra fun, maybe every 10 episodes. I'm already planning something truly special for episode 135. Anyway, I've enjoyed seeing my viewership grow, and I hope it'll continue to do so. I'm up to 180 kills. I've got 14 more to go to reach my goal, and I'd love to have as many people reach it alongside me as I can. If you know anyone trustworthy who might enjoy this videos or joining the chat room, maybe reach out to them. Also, stop asking for a face reveal. I'm not gonna do it. Thanks so much and adios. I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I laughed. I actually laughed at a man being burned alive because of a bad Star Wars quote, and because he looked so funny in his underwear and clone trooper helmet. I instantly felt disgusted with myself. I remember looking down at my hands, which were covered in Cheeto dust, asking myself how the hell I had gotten to the point that I could laugh at a man's death. I was really glad I'd been watching that episode alone. I was so close to quitting that day, not because I was sick of watching people die, but because I no longer got sick when they died, and that scared me. I had spent almost three years in the high score chat room, joking about those deaths with actual psychopaths online, and I was afraid I was starting to become one myself. I remember calling up my supervisor's number on my phone, my finger hovering an inch over that green call button for what felt like hours. In the end, I didn't quit because that would be letting these monsters win. I would continue watching, continue chatting and joking online with these disgusting people for as long as it took to bring John Doe down. Bar 20 or 3. Five months later, I finally got something. Episode 134 came out on November 8th, 2016. In episode 134, John Doe is out on a trail south of Mountain, Georgia. In the video, he explained how he had learned about a woman who had posted on Facebook about her plans to walk 200 miles up and down the Appalachian Trail with her husband. Late afternoon, John Doe lies in wait for the two of them hiding in the bushes. Once they are close enough, he shoots them both with his silenced AK-47. Kill a 190, kill 191. He put them both in a bag and dragged them back to his RV. That was where John Doe messed up. I missed it on the first playthrough but I always watched the videos twice, taking heavy notes the second time. As John approaches his RV, the camera comes into the clearing where his RV is parked. For a split second, for just seven frames, viewers get a clear, unedited look at his RV. Seven frames, seven sixtieths of a second. That was all I needed. The moment I saw it, I picked up the phone and called my supervisor. Sir, I've got something. We need to run a license plate. We ran the plate. 
We got a name, Jonas True. We got a photo, young man, curly brown hair, goatee. 5'11", 183 pounds. For the next 24 hours, the FBI did nothing but make phone calls until every state trooper and local cop within 200 miles of Georgia was on the prowl for Jonas True and an RV with the license plate. The next day, said license plate was sighted by an automatic camera outside Forest Park in North Carolina. They sent a team of state troopers within an hour. I got to watch live body cam footage on a conference call with a dozen senior FBI agents, including my old partner, Agent Crichton. As we waited for the team to arrive on the scene, Creighton messaged me privately. Creighton, what was he going for? 190 kills. Lou, 194. He's at 191. Creighton, my God. Creighton, you know I'm retiring in two years. I'm glad I get to watch him go down before I leave. Lou, so am I. But, well, part of me is actually disappointed. Part of me actually wanted him to make it. Is that fucked up or what? Creighton, no. Who wouldn't want to say I busted the most prolific serial killer in history? It'd look damn good on a resume. One of my screens switched to live footage from a drone as it flew over Forest Park. It spotted a camper that looked like John Doe's RV. The squad sped towards the site in police cars. They stopped about a hundred yards away and dispersed into the woods. 18 state troopers, each with military-grade weapons and camouflaged body armor, slinked through the brush and surrounded the camper. Once they all confirmed their position, the commander gave the order. Nine men and two dogs advanced toward the RV. Sir, up there in the trees, said one of the troopers as they advanced. Camera trap. The commander looked up where the trooper was pointing to see a camouflaged camera strapped to a tree. Should we destroy it? asked the trooper. No, sound will alert him. The camera might not even be his, said the commander. They continued to the camper. The RV sat alone and still. The window shutters were down. The remains of a fireplace with blackened charcoal logs lay next to it. The troopers stopped and stood behind trees about 20 yards away from the RV, their weapons trained on the door. The commander pulled out a megaphone from his pack. Jonas True, you are under arrest. Come out of the RV slowly with your hands in the air. Silence. You have 10 seconds before we break in. Silence. For 10 seconds. The commander put away the megaphone. All right, boys, here we go. The nine troopers sprinted up to the side of the RV. One of them aimed a shotgun at the door's handle. The commander nodded. The soldier declared, Breaching! He shot a hole in the door, pumped his gun, and kicked the door open. He and another trooper rushed into the cabin, guns at the ready, but the vehicle was dark and empty. In the middle of the RV stood a video camera, with a red light glowing on its side, and a black backpack lying on the floor. A second before it happened, I remembered what John Doe had said. He had something truly special planned for episode 135. It's a trap, I shouted, from my comfortable chair a thousand miles away. I was in Minneapolis, the team was in North Carolina. I often wonder if the signal of my voice made it to that soldier's earpiece in time, or if he realized on his own what was about to happen before the bombs went off. There was a flash and a bang. The trooper's body cam suddenly went blinding white and then lost all signal. My screen switched to briefly to one of the troopers outside the RV, but another flash destroyed that signal as well. We had been tricked. Those men had walked right into John Doe's trap. Both the dogs were killed. The two men inside the camper died instantly. The other seven were hospitalized, three of them in critical condition. Over the last three years, I'd watched hundreds of men, women, and children die on a computer screen. After a while, stopped affecting me that much, beyond a nightmare or two. But those officers are different. I was the reason they were there. I reported the information that led them into that trap. I sent them into that monster's jaws. I think about them every day. John Doe had rigged up a homemade bomb in the backpack inside the RV. He had also planted a landmine, then buried it, and disguised it as a used fire pit. I know because two hours after the doomed mission, episode 135 of High Score was released on the Darknet.
Episode 135, aired at 5.04 p.m., November 10, 2016. I'll never forget that date. As always, ACDC's Thunderstruck plays during the opening credits, but this time, instead of the regular footage, there is a montage of fireworks and people dancing. Once the title card plays, John Doe appears. He explains how he knew the FBI had been watching for years now. He wanted to give them a gift to show his appreciation. He had purposefully revealed his license plate in the previous episode. He had purposefully got himself spotted outside Forest Park. He planted the bombs and the cameras in and around his RV, and then had a darknet friend pick him up and drive him to a nearby safe house, where he watched the state troopers surround his RV. Once they were right where he wanted them, all he had to do was press a button. With all his camera traps in the trees, he had footage from multiple angles, as the explosions massacred the men. And you know what's really great? My hackers confirmed that just minutes ago, one of the troopers in the hospital was declared dead. Guys, you know what this means? I made it. I have 194 kills. In the video, John Doe spends the next few minutes lavishing and praising all his followers and viewers. He thanks his video editors, moderators, hackers, and other collaborators who helped him along the way. And then John Doe does something he's never done before. He brings his hands up to his head and removes his mask. He looks similar to the image on his driver's license, though his hair is a bit longer, and he's a more clean-shaven now. So there you go, guys. I've finally revealed my ugly mug. I hope you're not too disappointed. And one last thing. I want to thank one person in particular who's been with me for, let's see, it would be three years now. As I watched, my hair stood up in the back of my neck and my heart began to race. I was suddenly terrified, as though my body knew what was coming, even though my head didn't. Thank you, Fly on the Wall 3, or should I say Special Agent Richard Liu. I want to thank you for your loyal patronage. I'm so glad you got my hint with the license plate. This is probably my greatest episode yet, and it's all thanks to you. I know you've been watching so you can arrest me and destroy this community, but you've been with us so long, contributing with each view, that this really is your accomplishment too. For me, knowing that the law was searching for me made all this so much more exciting. It's been a pleasure, Agent Liu. Now, some of y'all have worried that the show will end once I hit Wonder 94. I want to assure you, absolutely not. Right now, I have the most confirmed kills of any lone killer. But Garavito and Lopez both claim that they killed as many as 300 people. I don't just want to be the best in terms of kills that the stupid pigs were able to confirm. I want to be the best for sure. So don't worry. High Score Season 2 is coming soon. And with that, I'm going to sign out. Yours truly, the greatest serial killer who ever lived. <laughs>